Welcome, my name is Kelly. And I'm Josh. And this is Fanimated, an animation fan podcast where we get a chance to geek out about our favorite animated media. Today we're talking about, quite possibly, the best Pixar film of all time, WALL-E! And before we jump into it, just a reminder that Fanimated is retiring big sad face. Uh, You will be able to find our entire episode archives as well as any new upcoming content on the Fanimated YouTube channel. Our final podcast episode will release on September 26, 2023. Fanimated will no longer be available on your podcasting platform of choice after December 31st of 2023. So again, subscribe to the Fanimated YouTube channel for all your animation fan needs. More information about this change can be found on the recent What You Watch in episode number 32. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everyone's support of the show the past five years. And Josh, let's jump into Wally or fly into Wally. <laughs> yes, let us <laughs> fly into space and discuss the apocalypse. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> so dark, yet so beautiful. So hopeful. So hopeful. I love this film. I do too. Um, this is one of my favorites of, like you said, it's one of the, I think it's one of the best Pixar films. It, it is one of my favorites. That mm-hmm. is absolutely true. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this film was like archived. It's like a good, it's, it's a good one. <laughs> Can yeah. I say that on a re- review podcast? It's a good one. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's yeah. such insightful. I'm so insightful uh, stuff. Words uh, that we have. Words. Yeah, no, but it legit is just one of the most beautiful animated films of all time. Um, and also, story wise, absolutely breathtaking. I'm a huge fan. I know I'm kind of like jumping, jumping many, many things here, but I am a huge fan of stories with no dialogue or minimal dialogue and this film is like cream of the crop yeah same i absolutely agree absolutely i'm gonna say absolutely a lot but it's true (laughs) it's one of my favorites and you know when i was doing a little bit of research on wally after i watched it again um i found that um the film the film's crew and their animation crew like just kind of everybody they watched a buster keaton and a Charlie Chaplin film every day for almost a year. And they even occasionally watched a Harold Lloyd picture. Uh, those are like, you yes. know, incredible silent film act, uh, actors and producers, uh, silent film makers. And I just thought that that was so cool. Like, like of course they would be studying a silent film for something like this, because this is mostly a silent film. And, yes. and I just think that, like... S- to cite Buster Keaton's stone face as something that like <laughs> c- helps you know that you can convey emotion silently with very little dialogue is just mm-hmm. like such a beautiful thing to me. And I, I, you know this about me, Kelly. I have always loved silent films. I've always loved Buster Keaton, particularly. I mean, I have a yes. hat. I have a I have a pork pie hat hanging on my wall right there. Uh, right behind you (laughs) because uh i love buster keaton and i love his his work and so i just think it's super cool that they used inspiration regularly as they were creating this film i didn't know that and i just think that of course it makes sense oh absolutely because you might not learn from the best (laughs) yeah in terms of physicality and all of that and truly amazing how they can you do all this physicality with pretty limited robot designs as well, mm. which is pretty wild to me. Um, but before we jump into it too deeply, Josh, when was the first time you saw this film, if you remember at all? Was uh, this part of your childhood? Um, well, I think the movie was like 2008, right? Yes, yeah. Um, so 2008, I was in high school. Um I think I probably watched it in high school. I don't, I don't really remember exactly like when or where I was or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do remember that I loved it when I watched it, and I had nobody to talk to about it <laughs> because oh, no. nobody around me at the time uh, also loved it. Uh, people were mm-hmm. like, "Oh yeah, it's good, but it's kind of weird." And I, I just remember thinking, "But it's so special." <laughs> 
<laughs> and nobody seemed to care at that time. So that was kind of a bummer. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't remember why that was, like what what the other people around me were doing that they didn't care for it. They just didn't talk about it. So um, I am very happy to be talking about it with you, Kelly, <laughs> because it did it did make an impact on me. Like I I loved it. And uh, I watched it a bunch. And, you know, I also have a special place in my heart for musicals. So, like, Hello, Dolly being referenced in this movie mm-hmm. is also really special to me. So I just think that it it hits a certain uh, set of things that I already loved, even at that yeah. time when I watched it. So, um so that was, I, I don't really, like, so again, I guess to answer your question, I don't really remember the first time, but I'm sure it was amazing. <laughs> yes. I also don't remember the exact first time I watched it, but I know I watched it, if not at the theater, probably pretty close to when it came out on DVD, because my brother is definitely still young enough that we would go see films um, and I know we had the DVD growing up too. So mm. I had seen it. It wasn't my favorite, um, when I first saw it, like I enjoyed it, but it was never one that I returned to over and over again. Like I was probably 2008, probably watching like Kung Fu Panda or something, oh, but, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it definitely was one I hadn't seen in a long time before watching it. For this episode and I am so glad you did because as an adult I like love it 10 million times more oh yeah like why like what what about it as an adult made you love it more um I for whatever reason like when I was younger I didn't like robots about like I didn't like stories oh. about robots huh. trying to humanize robots like I wasn't really into that like, I had a, like, had a weird problem with it. I didn't like, like, they're it. evil. Like, technology shouldn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly just, like, just like I can't get into rooting for these characters because hmm. they don't have a soul. You know what oh, I mean? Sure, yeah. Soul. And a little emo middle school, Kelly. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> At some point in our lives, we all get obsessed on where the soul is and where it comes from. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as an adult, I'm proud to say that I have loosened up a little bit. And <laughs> um, I was absolutely 100% able to empathize and love Wally way more than I ever really did originally. And... Also, like, he and his relationship with Eve is so much more relatable now. Mm. Um, And, like, you know, obviously, when I saw it originally, you know, I understood basic climate crisis concepts and um, (laughs) things of that nature. But now, you know, like, 15 years later, it's definitely, like... It feels even more relatable in that sense as well. Yeah, ex- ex- absolutely. Again, <laughs> because like mm-hmm. the the climate crises uh, have only um, gotten worse, and perhaps as adults we are just more aware of it. You know, mm-hmm. and, like I mm-hmm. I remember thinking about it when I was in high school and just being like, well, I, I guess I grew up in a small town, and so I was kind of just thinking oh you know it's probably not as bad as all that like this is a nice thing to just to be able to imagine and so I didn't ever think about it as seriously um, and mm-hmm. watching it now as an adult and rec- and living in an urban center mm-hmm. I, I, I am very well aware of trash being all over the place and how we need to figure that out um, Yeah. so that makes sense that you know the environmentalism piece of it maybe didn't connect with you at that age not not quite as much and i think too like my um just attention span wasn't ready for like like this movie is it clips like it clips along but there are lots of slow beats like Mm. it takes deep breaths yeah and as an adult i love that so much more oh yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. The, the breaks, the pauses, the beats, and and you know you do have to kind of give it your full attention. You mm-hmm. can't just like listen 
uh, and kind of sort of watch, which maybe, you know, when your attention isn't as developed, uh, you don't, you don't do that as much. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm making an assumption. I don't know about it's development of attention in kids, but <laughs> like I would no, think, I don't either. <laughs> that, that might have something to do with it. And so, like you do, but all that to say, you do have to really give it something. And mm-hmm. when you're an adult, it, it you you can give it something that uh, feels a little bit more peaceful because it's not as crazy as, say, for example. Um, the Mitchells versus the Machines, <laughs> which is, right. you know, constantly bombarding you with energy and light and sound and humor and different things. Mm-hmm. Um, this, yeah. like you said, it breathes more. So that makes sense, too. Mm-hmm. So in these final Fanimated episodes, I've been giving my hosts the choice of what they want to discuss. So my question for you is... It, However briefly or long of a story, why did you choose Wally as your final episode? Well, here's the thing, Kelly. <laughs> I love silence. Uh, I always have. And I love music. Always have. And to me, this film combines silence and music to tell a story in one of the most beautiful ways that encapsulates what animation can do in a way that you can't do in other mediums. I Like, going to space and having a robot that can twirl around and that can kind of dance with a fire extinguisher and, you know, <laughs> that... Um, to me, that does something that you can't achieve in the same way with film or other types of media. Um, and I think that to, to be able to utilize silence and, uh, music and animation in, uh, in a otherworldly way where robots are moving and humans are basically gelatinous blobs <laughs> yeah. you, you know like those are things you can't that are well maybe you can nowadays the film is pretty advanced but it's just not as uh effective i think um and you can do it in such a way that is poignant and is powerful and is emotional and um connects to you on in a way that i find to be really um universal that doesn't rely too heavily on dialogue it doesn't rely uh on words to convey expression or exposition like those are really um difficult things to do and that you in this film is a to me um perfect example of what you can achieve in animation and that's why i chose it as my last one um is like it to me identifies that really special aspect of animation um And it's also just really personal for me because Mm. I love, um, I love the idea of being able to tell stories this way. You know, I'm, when I was in high school, um, I often would, actually, I I have to go back even further. When I was in elementary (laughs) school, I would have a bad day sometimes and my choice to get around that was to say you know what i'm just not gonna talk today i just won't talk to anyone and 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 that'll that'll show everybody that i mean business (laughs) (laughs) um and i'll be able to get through life without even talking and and maybe it'll even get their attention and you know a little (laughs) squirt of a kid but um i remember doing that and uh just then uh, then all i would end up doing is observing right? Because I'm not really talking much. Nobody's talking to me then. And I'm not really uh, uh, putting a lot out there. But I would still be able to communicate with people. I would still do it. And I would I would observe for a while. And then I would communicate in a silly way. And I had friends who would be like, you know, uh, for example, there were there was a conversation I remember having. Um, it, I was probably in third grade, where I didn't want to talk because having one of my grumpy days and I had a friend ask me about it and he was like like what why aren't you talking and 
I would just gesture, you know, I would just be like shrugging my shoulders, like, mm, I don't know. And then uh, the kid would be like, well, I mean, I guess you don't have to talk, like we can still be friends. And I was like nodding my head, like, yeah, we can. And then he's like, well, here, come here. And he like brought me over to the playground. And then we, he like guided me through um, being friends with him without me having to talk. And it was this really, really special moment where he, you know, he just talked and he would ask me questions and then I would, you know, gesture or I would point to something or I would, mm-hmm. um, you know, we would act out stories together often. And so there's, I have lots of memories with the same friend where he would be playing out uh, Sonic the Hedgehog and I would be Tails and, you know, we would <laughs> act out an episode of our of the show or whatever. Um and so I just remember after that realizing that I I didn't need to talk to communicate and I had this friend who was willing to meet me at that level. Um, and so I chose to continue talking to him. <laughs> and so I was yes. like, you know what? Man, I will talk actually, you know, and he kind of brought me out of it through that. And, um, and I kind of stopped doing it then. But I still loved that idea of being able to communicate without having to say words um and Mm -hmm. you know using using sounds or whatever and so i think that this film connects to me on a really personal level and that and like that inner child that's inside of me who doesn't want to talk because he's anxious or you know he doesn't have his way with words and and i often have struggled with my words there was a period of time again where um, I liked to study mime and clown and I could I could do stuff without being able to speak because it was easier and, and I really struggled. I'd stumble over my words and I took speech classes in high school and I did speech uh, competitions and whatnot to try to get better at it and I just always felt like I was failing. But when I mimed, I excelled and I felt special and I felt unique and that I could mm-hmm. do that. And... Um, and I ended up finding a lot of success in that. I literally traveled the world as a mime for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, you know, it's a very special thing for me to be able to communicate um, silently and without using words. It just connects to that that child inside of me, like I already said. And so to see other characters in film, in animation, also doing that and... Uh, and doing it in such a way that's incredibly endearing and using little sound effects and chirps and and beeps. Yes. Um, and yet you still know very clearly what they're communicating. Um, mm-hmm. Whether it's, you know, the, the parts where uh, Wally and the cockroach are <laughs> communicating about, you know, stay here. And the cockroach doesn't want to, so he follows them anyway. Uh, or when Eve is first talking to Wally and they're she's trying to communicate the word directive and he doesn't know what it means and so yeah. she shows him what it means to her and so then he shows her what it means to him by like grabbing all the trash and making a tiny bad yeah. trash cube because <laughs> he was so excited <laughs> he figured it out <laughs> you know like those little moments are like so cool um, and I think that nonverbal communication to me is uh, so fascinating and so important. Mm -hmm. And so like learning that, um, uh, like by watching a film like this, you can learn that how important it is and how that you actually do understand that. And like you actually know how to understand and communicate non-verbally and that doesn't require a language. And and, um, like that just... Uh, is I think really important about life too because I've I've studied it a little bit in college and learned learned about how nonverbal communication is I I can't quite remember the percentage but it was something like ninety percent of mm. of your communication with other people it's I don't it's probably not ninety percent it's probably eighty or something like that but it's really really high it's the majority of your communication with other people isn't the words you say it's uh, the way that you move. It's the the way that you look. It's your hand gestures. It's uh, the way that you tilt your head uh, or shrug your shoulders or carry your body. Like we we just we learn so much about an individual that jumps directly to our subconscious in seconds because of nonverbal communication, and that goes into you know it also goes into you know the uh, um, 
the way you say words. It's not just the words or not the words. It's it's also how you use the words and that those things too. Um, but I just think that that's just so special. So all that to say, I chose Wally because it's just really a a vital and personal piece of film for me that helps us recognize how we can communicate as human beings and how much we fail at doing it uh, and uh, how if we don't there are troubles that can get uh, whether that's in the environmental issues that are brought into the film or if it's just the fact that you know Wally can't easily communicate with the humans um, they they won't communicate non-verbally they're pretty much only communicating verbally because they're mm. hovering around in their little chairs yeah. and they won't even look at each other they only use video screens mm -hmm. you know like i just think that that's uh, an important lesson as well the, to just the importance of connection between people and these are all subversive things that like don't uh, necessarily come at first glance of just watching this little movie but that's what i get out of it uh, and to me, I think everyone should watch it because of that. Even if they don't recognize or learn about nonverbals, <laughs> they like know still that they can understand these characters uh, in a in a new way. Um, so that's the long winded answer to your question, Kelly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I did say you could choose brief or long, so I am glad you chose long. I totally see that how this connects with your overarching life story and how this sort of connected to you when you were younger as well anyways nonverbal communication is important that's what we're getting from this and um nonverbal storytelling is uh unique and valued yeah and extremely difficult you know like um you know mr bean like Rowan yeah. Hutchinson, he's great, right? I love him. I've always loved him. And I learned from a documentary about him that <clears throat> working with him is not at all what you would expect uh, because he's incredibly choreographed and he will get really specific about, okay, turn here, uh, put my leg like this, then move my arm to lean on the counter like that. Um, hmm. And it's like everything that he does in his mr bean sketches were always really really um choreographed and you don't look you don't think that when you watch it because he does it so seamlessly and fluid that it seems just really natural but that's the point because each of those tiny little details communicate something differently and you can't even usually put words to it uh, like well what's the difference between you know holding my hand like a claw and holding it like it's flat like does that actually communicate something yeah but like what <laughs> you know mm -hmm. it's it's hard to pin that down um but it still says a feeling it still communicates something um and i think that the way that the character design was for wally to like actually connect this to, <laughs> to what we're talking about um was is really deliberate on their part you know because he he had only the little claws right and so it was open or close or how much and you know, he had the two i guess sort of fingers <laughs> um, um but he could he there wasn't a ton of gesture that he could do he could extend his arms out because he had the little extendo arms uh and he could you know turn them around in certain ways but he was a lot more limited than a human is because of, he was built out of gears you know and uh so i'm sure that they talked about that sort of thing in their development and you know when his hand is like this, even though um, that's all that he can do, <laughs> you know, when it's one hand, when it's two hands, that means something different. And so I'm sure that they were talking about, like, how does he communicate his love for um, this cockroach <laughs> with the little, like, beep, 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 um, mm -hmm. sound effect and the, like, beckoning of his little claw hand. You know, like, that just um, had to have been deliberate I, I can't imagine that they would have glossed over something like that because when it comes to these nonverbal things they are very specific and unlike a mr bean sketch um animation is created frame by frame so mm -hmm. they 
have to be deliberate. Yeah. Um, and so it's how they use that deliberateness in the right way. And they definitely did here. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I am still floored, by the way. Like, this is one of my favorite things about animation. is just the fact they literally have to intentionally design and create everything you see on screen. Mm. Yeah. Everything. And that, everything. Everything. And I say this, like, so much in the podcast. Just because it's one of my favorite things. And it just leaves me in awe. And not only do you have to do all these nonverbal cues with these characters... The thing that caught my attention this time, because my boyfriend was walking, watching it with me, he was like, oh, the little tracks in the dirt from yeah. Wally's wheels are, like, completely matched up. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. Totally. What a good observation. That is wild. <laughs> um, absolutely fascinating. I love all the details. Like, but just on a general, general note about animation in this film, it absolutely holds up this many years later Mm. um it still looks phenomenal it's insane and i will say my favorite thing about the art the artistry is the composition Mm. there's so many points where i was just like this is a piece of art this is a work of art this (laughs) is so good oh my goodness the composition in this film is phenomenal where everything is placed is so good especially when they're on earth like those honestly i know earth is a wasteland but those are my favorite scenes when they're on earth oh Um, they're beautiful yeah like the the shopping cart scene is uh, funny (laughs) but also like so beautiful um just the way that the light comes through the window oh the lighting oh so good all the lighting on earth is spectacular i know that um i did again on some of my research <clears throat> they did a lot of conversation with um, directors of photography, you know, filmmakers who are um, really, really uh, specific about cameras and lenses and lighting. And they were trying to figure out realistic lighting with um, fog and with all of the like rubble everywhere and how it would affect things. And there's just that constant dust in the air, which is totally different from the second half mm. of the film that's all clean, you know? So the mm-hmm. lighting is spectacular because it's just like constant diffusion everywhere. <laughs> and yes. like it casts this un- this uh, beautiful golden glow on uh, everything. Like that scene where I think it's in the beginning, it's one of the opening shots, I think, where it's like um, sweeping down over the towers of garbage everywhere. Mm-hmm. And they just like disappear in the silhouettes as they just like get further oh away. Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. so cool. I it's so it. good. Oh my gosh, this film. And that's not even to mention the, you know, when they're dancing around in space and it's beautiful and gorgeous and oh what? Gosh, yeah. That's just it, so yeah. beautiful. Oh, it's one of your favorite images from that dancing sequence because it's, it's truly one of the most beautiful moments of the whole movie. My favorite part is right at the beginning when they keep missing each other and it's just like you have these, the pathways of where they've been, you know, with the foam and with her like... You know, like, the zoom yeah, out and trail, going, yeah. the, seeing the trails, like, intersect and stuff. Like, that, I think, is really, really pretty. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that. I like when they're um, flying around the engine, you know? And it, mm-hmm. uh, it's, like, the huge bursts of light coming through when you see them. Like, they at that point, I think they've kind of figured out their choreography together. And so there's a little bit more yeah. smoothness. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I, yeah, it's so pretty. It's so good. Ah, this movie is so pretty. Um, um, I heard a little mm. bit about the uh, animation having come from, like, doing stuff underwater. Do you know much about that? Underwater as in, like, because they're in space? Yeah, like, a lot of the space stuff, it, they learned because of Finding Nemo and, like, the underwater mm. stuff in that. Yeah, yeah. I think that would just that would make sense just how how characters can move around in a 3D space would be basically the same almost the same as water in that sense. Um so that makes a lot yeah, that makes sense to me that it would be like that. Probably a little easier cuz you don't have to work with like water <laughs> and like 
true. bubbles and stuff. Although instead of bubbles, they had other you know trails of things. Particles. So I guess yeah. there's still lots of particles and, and such. Um, but that would make sense, especially for Eve because Eve is very she you know she flies around a lot, so she's like basically swimming around but flying around. So yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Okay. That makes sense. I mm-hmm. I read like a tiny thing about it, and I was like, oh, I I, uh, uh, I don't understand, <laughs> but that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I definitely am glad. Like, I know I read that Wally was um, brainstormed in the '90s. Yeah. Very early on, along with a lot of those other films, but early films. But I'm glad that this one was kept on the back burner for so long so that the animation technology could get to the point of where it was yeah, <laughs> when they made I it agree. because i think of like monsters inc or you know earlier films i'm just like mm, you know it's good but and at the time the animation was great but i definitely don't think this film would have had the same impact with the limited um animation technology that there was yeah, what what do you think would have specifically not been up to par? Um, definitely all the lighting that we're freaking out about right now <laughs> would, would not would not have been the same at all. The textures, no, no, not the textures. And like, also, you're working with a lot of blubbery humans mm. that, like, since two thousand eight, like. The, the the way fat moves on a character has it, it has so astronomically changed and has been better but like at the at 2008 it's like okay yeah that was good like working with if you go back to other Pixar films and maybe finding Nemo isn't quite as bad but like it really does I mean it, there's a reason they they had a movie about toys right they're plastic right. they don't move like they don't move like flesh moves mm-hmm. and so um that specific point like definitely um benefited from waiting and like i don't know how they would have made like the axiom even like mm. and some of these giant landscaping like uh, the towers of yeah. garbage and the ax- like these really large set pieces that i like computers straight up wouldn't have been able to handle that makes sense yeah because those mm-hmm. are huge i mean ac- the axiom mm-hmm. itself was like one uh, like a, a three miles long or something like that i remember reading some sort yeah. of stat like that's that's a big thing (laughs) it's a big 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 prop yeah so yeah but it still it still holds up like i said it mostly like it still holds up i was still thoroughly impressed with this film like more so than i thought i would be watching something from 2008 (laughs) Yeah. So it, good uh, job. Good job. I Pixar. agree. Um, well, props to them. Props to them all for um, mm-hmm. making something that lasts. Uh, well done, team. Well done. Go team. Um, I have a question. Okay. For you. Because I don't quite have an answer yet, but I want to explore. Why did they choose My Fair Lady as the movie that Wally watches over and over again? And why did they choose that song in particular for us to hear about 8 million times in the movie? <laughs> um, I actually do have an answer to that question. Awesome! <laughs> um, so I'm pretty sure it was Andrew Stanton, the director, who was in Hello, Dolly! when he was a kid. <laughs> Uh-huh. And so okay. he, he knew the script and the story and the music really well. Yeah. Um, and so he had picked it for that. Uh, additionally, um, again, I think it's it's Andrew Stanton. It might have been one of the other executive team, but I'm pretty sure it was him. He had said that his uncle, um, or it was the, the music, the person who did the music, uh, something like that their uncle was in the hello dolly movie the original oh uh, cool and so they had this connection of the film and the the song 
that was chosen, or the two songs that were chosen, um, just encapsulated that feeling of like the first one being uh, Wally's kind of curiosity and his like just desire for <laughs> for love, you know, because that's the whole story of Hello Dolly is these two guys, mm-hmm. right, like go off into the world and try to find love, <laughs> and mm-hmm. that's kind of Wally's motivation is the entire time he just wants to hold hands with eve because that's what love means to him that's what he is he's learned um and so i think that um that was a big part of that and then the second one the second song is just like the big romance piece in hello dolly yeah. and so of course that just tracks with the, that, <clears throat> that those two songs being paired because it's all one thing that wally found and was able to you know use throughout the whole story so i think i think that's why it was chosen. Well, I certainly don't have any qualms with it. And what better, you know, fun, golden agey musical to choose? Um, because, yeah, you got to have something that is very, ro- yeah, romantic, as in love relationships, but also romanticized, yes. as in golden age musicals. Absolutely. Often are. Schmaltzy and all of their awful glory. Awful, yes, just ooey, gooey, cheesy, and it's lovely. Yeah. And it's the perfect contrast to Wally's broken futuristic world. Yeah, that song, you know, out there, there's a world all full of sparkle, and you're looking at all this trash everywhere. <laughs> like, uh-huh. What a great contrast, what a great um, yeah. way to set it up. And I think I also read something that they were thinking about doing like a French song, like kind of a French cafe piece for that beginning, mm. which would also kind of do that kind of contrast. But yeah. Triplets of Belleville had been released recently and they didn't want to sound like they were copying their their style sure. and sound. Um, and I agree that it was a good choice that like yeah. this, I think that it's a great way to start something so um, charming as Wally. It sets the tone for Wally's character in the midst of setting the tone for the environment. Because you have to, they're establishing both of these things at the same time. And it's a lovely contrast. Yeah. Yeah. And like the, the whole story being about love and whatnot, just, it just makes mm-hmm. sense. That goes into my next question. Okay. Which is, what is the thesis of this film? Because I still get kind of confused with like, okay, great. It's about robots and love. Oh, wait, no. It's about the end of humanity on Earth. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> How are these two things connected? Yeah. yeah, that is a weird thing that I honestly think that they didn't intend um, hmm. I have a feeling just from reading some of this stuff about their, like what they were working on that, um, their big goal was just the question of like, what if mankind had to leave earth and somebody forgot to turn off the last robot, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. that's kind of how it started. And, um, from there, uh, they just really play with this this robot idea, and they play with the love and the fun of that, and then they they put it against this apocalyptic background backdrop, and um, I I have a feeling. Here's another thing that I read. I guess that it gives me this feeling. Uh, the very final scene when they get to the Earth and then they uh, you know go off and do their thing. There's that sequence in. Uh, the credits that's kind of showing what happens to the humans afterwards where they kind of reclaim the planet Mm -hmm. over time. Um, They did an early showing of the film that was mostly the same, but they didn't have that ending. They didn't have that Mm. credit sequence. And people were like, wow, that's depressing. (laughs) Like they thought that the whole movie was just about these two robots and then, you know, humans dying. And so they added this sequence that turned it to a positive note which also added this kind of environmental like theme to it that was sort of there that like the whole time because it was just like well the humans trashed the planet like this is what's going to happen to the future and um, mm-hmm. but what it ended up doing is it also added this message of we need to take care of our planet 
You know, it kind of right. adds to what the captain discovers along the way, you know, with his um, learning to return to the, the planet. And so I mm-hmm. think that they weren't necessarily intending it to be as politically, like, environmentalist. Um, but it definitely very clearly and strongly comes across that way. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that they're, like, totally fine with that. <laughs> they're, like, because they yeah. agree. Um, and so the thesis to me is, you know, maybe more, like, because Andrew Stanton, again, said something about that, like, irrational love. I remember reading that. Um, but I don't know that I agree that, like, maybe that's what he said. He would have said irrational love, like, defeats life's programming or something like that. Um, hmm. But, like, I don't know that I would say that that's what it's really about. Like, that's really what the thesis communicates. It, it, it maybe more communicates, you know, love... Um, love and care whether it's for each other for for robots for stuff for the earth is what um keeps us going it's what keeps life moving on is the care that we take does that make sense it does i'm gonna be devil's advocate and say that actually humans survived for 700 years without any of that yeah, they survived, oh, yeah. but they, they survived. Did but, they live? Ooh, that yeah. is the that did is. Did they it. live, Kelly? They and live? and also like they were just getting worse. <laughs> and they eventually getting... they would have devolved further and lost their limbs and would have not even been humans. <laughs> yeah, they sunk into it's just this crazy futuristic world of capitalism that is like the what what the worst of it could be. But yeah. I also just going back to these two ideas, right? We have the idea, we have two stories, okay? Th- 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 this movie is definitely like two different things yeah, happening. Yeah, it is. It is Wally's story, and then there's humanity's story. Mm-hmm. And what's what doesn't quite click for me is, okay, if you're just going to focus on Wally. Which I think is the stronger story and the main story uh, title, titular, titular character. But yeah. <laughs> his story is going from alone to not being alone. That's his story. Okay. That's the happy ending. He gets to not be alone anymore. That's the one thing that has changed because they're back on Earth. Yeah. Everything's the same except now he's not alone. That's the one thing. Okay. I can track with Humanity, that. Humanity. If you were going to make it all about humanity, you wouldn't have a robot as the main character. Mm-hmm. Or were you? Like, to me, I don't think I've learned anything about humanity. You know? Like, if, if like, let's say, okay, their second story of, oh, we've got to, you know, get out of our floating chairs and see the world and, like, and understand our purpose of being caretakers of the planet we left okay if that's the story then there are so many more satisfying ways of doing that like i don't feel like that story was satisfying Mm. in in the film because there's not enough time to do it right well it's like Like, half a story because it's it's only the second half mm -hmm. of the film where the humans are in it um, yeah, like if that was the story, we would we would start on the axiom. We, mm-hmm. you know, like right. it would be about discovering Earth f- through the eyes of the people who have never experienced Earth. Yeah, but we are experiencing the story from a robot who has experienced Earth and has then come back to Earth. It's just such a weird B plot, and I and I think I understand. We are coming from from an explanation of maybe possibly this is why this happened. It just kind of evolved this way and mm-hmm. naturally turned into that. But I don't feel like it was the best choice of B plots. <laughs> sure. Like, um, you could have had Wally meet Eve and have his life be changed and not be alone. 
Without humans ever even being involved, to be That's honest. true. Yeah, you could have, like, the only humans that we ever see were, like, the videos th from the beginning, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, like, let's say he goes to... Uh, he follows Eve to uh, off the planet and follows her on his on a spaceship and like the whole thing happens on a spaceship with other robots. Would we have lost anything, really? Um, no, like even if uh, it's kind of yeah, it's kind of a little bit sad. Like okay, mm. what if the axiom is empty? Like humans didn't make it. Yeah, that would be a little heavy. But then again, be. this movie does feel a little heavy for a kids movie anyway. <laughs> but like, they could have done that. Yeah. Nothing could have changed. And it would still be the same thing. Kind of. Yeah. I, I mean, well, what about, like, the captain? Because he's the one who... Mm -hmm. he's, the, he's the human that really helps everything mm -hmm. um, get back to Earth. Um, and without him, you know, that, that may not have happened. Um, you know, could you have written in a different character? Sure. Um, but I do think that, like, having the humans there and having them return to Earth um, connects the, the humanity element mm -hmm. to the robots. I agree. I agree. I agree. I think that having humans there is more relatable from a viewer standpoint. But then again... We are talking about the company that made entire franchise with just toys as the yep. main character. So, <laughs> but there were still humans in Toy Story. Yeah. Okay. You know, like not as big of a role, but yes. No, but I, I wonder if the humans just have to be there in order to show that the the this is a human world. Mm. You know, to show mm -hmm. that um, there is a connection to our world in that they are human. Um, sure. Sure. You know, like like even in Monsters Inc., there there's and a the connection humans, to the human true. world. Um, in Bugs and Life, Finding Nemo, and mm -hmm. Finding Nemo, like there's always some. Not in Cars though. Cars is somewhere well, else in the well, multiverse. True, <laughs> true. There are no humans, but it's still like in on on Earth, I guess, in that way. Yeah, you have made your point, so I do <laughs> appreciate that. Yes, you're right. I'll I'll, I'll yeah. All the other oldies, oldie classic Pixar do have humans. So I, I don't know why I'm being devil's advocate about this and <laughs> having such a... It's I think hard. it's just something that I've always kind of not connected fully. The fact that this movie is two different films into hmm. one. And again, Wall-E is the main story and his arc is like full circle fantastic it hits all the great points. It has the, you know, fall into uh, oblivion when he doesn't remember anything for a hot second there. You know, like, yep. everything is great about his story. I have literally zero qualms about it. Um, it's just weird when now, like, halfway, like, a good huge chunk of the way into the movie, we now have to learn about and relate to all these humans all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. um, and the captain is a great character. Again, not not discounting that but it feels a little bit weird the timing this... is definitely weird i will give you that for sure that like mm -hmm. you don't really get to know john and mary like at all the two no. humans who fall out of their chairs like you it's kind of charming um mm -hmm. but there's not enough time in the screenplay uh for for any of the characters introduced at that point in the stage mm -hmm to really get to know them um right so i as at least as much as the what you will by the with the other characters by the end so <clears throat> i agree that the timing of it is is odd and um it's almost like you wanted to linger more on earth because there's just so much of the cool yeah. apocalypse life like what had it, what would have happened if the entire movie happened in apocalypse earth and it, we never go off planet. Um, yeah, that would have been really have, fascinating. Yeah, would it still be as good though? Like, would would we have missed some sort of personal connection? Right. Like, would we just be sad because we never see another human, and this whole thing is happening in the background of the d demise of all humanity? Yeah, and like um, uh, Wally, Eve comes to learn about Wally's world. 
Mm-hmm. What, maybe the humans and all of that is about e- Wally going to see Eve's world. Sure. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. You're right. You're right. He, like, needs... He, he needed the different environment to go through that challenge. Yeah. He needed... You know, it's a hero's journey. He has to leave right. his home. He has to leave. Yeah, he has to see a new world and come back. We did changed. it. Great. We, we gave. It out. Yeah. We all right. The there it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like in and again. You know, this is never, never, ever. When I go into brands like this, am I saying that the film is bad in any way? I just like to nitpick about story things that don't make sense to me, and I want to always. This is just how my brain works. I'm like, but what if we did something different? <laughs> because my brain is like, Ooh, let's clean it up the story a little bit. Um, I'm a I'm a real fan of of simple simple stories, and this one's yeah. a little more complex. Yeah, well, I think that's part of the point is that like, you know, the humans uh, wrecked the planet, and without that fact, no Wally, right? They right. built Wally because they wrecked the planet because they are messy. Yeah, yeah. And the and the humans, you know, use by and large and use their chairs to just avoid all mm-hmm. of the problems and their avoid 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 and to unconsciously, um, like get out of living because it's hard and messy mm-hmm. and complicated mm-hmm. like this film. <laughs> yes. And you know, when when Wally has to learn to. Um, he he doesn't have those, I don't know what you call them, um, inhibitions, I guess, or I don't mm-hmm. know, that's not the right word, but the things that cause us humans to do avoidance, he doesn't have the fear, maybe. He doesn't have the, uh, the like, self-preservation needs that we do, and so <clears throat> he can uh, just so wholeheartedly pursue love and connection mm. without mm-hmm. those fears and without mm-hmm. the avoidance of, you know, trying to, like, get out of stuff that we humans do. And I'm, maybe that's the, like, the point of the movie. <laughs> it's, it's, like... Maybe. Uh, trying to get us to, to, um, to, to, like, get off of our cell phones and get off of our, yeah. our technologies and uh, learn to connect and be and live in a messy world and be okay with it and, like, take care of it. And um, th- I could see that working in the whole context of everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here, here's a thesis for us. All right, go, Kelly. Thesis. Or 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 warning of like it takes a non-human robot to teach humanity what being a human is. Ooh, zing, Ooh. zing. <laughs> love and relationships are the most important thing. That's good, Kelly. I like that. Yeah, because that you know it's also what we're doing. And just we're using a film. Let's get meta. <laughs> a film <laughs> on non-human thing is teaching us how to love and connect to others. It's the same yes. thing. It's the same thing. We're, yes, yes. Snaps of approval. Snap, 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 snap. Snap, 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 snap. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, Josh, you have any other things you want to mention? Because it's about an hour. We're I am gonna, to. I'm going to mention one really small funny thing that I learned um, okay, after doing cool. some research from this film. So, Benjamin Burt Jr. was the sound designer. Uh, he also voiced Wally um, mm-hmm. and several of the other robots. <clears throat> He's also the sound designer for a lot of major films. Um, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, E.T. He was like, heavily involved in the sound design on those movies um but here's the fun fact he's also the man who is popularized using the wilhelm scream (laughs) in modern movies are you familiar with the wilhelm scream i am not josh please enlighten me what is that okay so 
<laughs> this has nothing to do with Wally. <laughs> no, that's fine. I am both very excited right now and also very nervous for what you're about to say. Okay. What is this scream? <laughs> so the Wilhelm scream is a very specific sound that uh, got popularized um, in Star Wars originally. Well, not originally, but it got popularized in Star Wars. There's this scene where um, Luke is... Um, with Leia, I think, and they're, like, divided by this big pillar but um, from these um, stormtroopers who are on the other side of this hole, and they're shooting at them, and they shoot one of the stormtroopers. He falls out, and he makes this scream. It's like this, Aah! Uh, it's a very, very particular scream. Just Google it, you'll hear it, and you'll be like, oh my goodness, I've heard that scream so many times. It's very, very popular, and it's in every Star Wars movie. Uh... <laughs> It's also in a ton of uh, the Indiana Jones movies. It's in a ton of action movies. Mm-hmm. And today it's become a very, it's a funny ongoing joke. And every time you hear it, I always laugh because I'm just like, oh, yeah, there's the <laughs> Wilhelm scream again. And yeah. um, it, it it's, it's just used to, like, show someone dying or someone falling or, right. or fall, you know, whatever. Um, but Benjamin Burt Jr., who popularized that by putting it into star wars he did uh he found it because of another movie called uh distant drums which is where it was originally it was in it was in these two films early on distant drums and the charge at feather river and they were i think in the 50s the scream was originally this uh singer who actually recorded it as a sound effect for these films when they were doing post-production uh, the singer's name is Sheb Woolley, and he's the guy who did the Purple People Eater, if you know that song, which is Okay, ridiculous. yeah. Wow. Um, so he he did this scream because in tar- the charge at Feather River, they needed um, the sound of uh, somebody n- whose the character's name was Wilhelm uh, getting okay, shot. Okay, that's where the name was coming from. Okay. Yes, his name, the character's name is Wilhelm. He gets shot in the thigh with an arrow. And he makes this scream sound, and then it happens like two or three other times immediately following that by oh, other men, no. and it's so funny. And I like because you're like, that's the same scream, and it's very obvious. Yeah, <laughs> when they do it right after another. Yep. And then it happens in this other movie called Distant Drums, where this guy's getting eaten by an alligator, <laughs> and he does that oh scream. My God. And so Benjamin Burt used it in Star Wars and then used it in a bunch of other stuff. And then it just caught on because it's this ridiculous scream. So now it's all over uh, filmmaking uh, and sound design history because it's this ridiculous scream. And that guy is the same guy who voiced Wally. And I think that that's wow. hilarious. <laughs> that is really excellent. I Thank you for bringing this little tidbit of film knowledge into my life because I'm now going to look on YouTube for every Wilhelm scream <laughs> in oh, yeah. Star Wars because I've never I've seen Star Wars all the Star Wars movies several times I've never no I never knew that yep so you'll hear it go. and then you'll hear it in a ton of Everything. films and you'll be like oh my gosh there it is again <laughs> I want in on this secret okay good now everyone else is in on the secret too yep welcome unless everyone already knows and I just am oblivious but there we go thank you you're welcome <laughs> you're Wilhelm <laughs> 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 yes i love it all about it well this was absolutely excellent as always josh um thank you for choosing wally as our final topic my pleasure this was really fun i was glad to talk about it with you kelly thanks for being so energetic and enjoying this process and this film with me it was really a nice time to go down a lots of different rabbit trails <laughs> good good <laughs> yes i hope everyone enjoyed the very diverse array of rabbit trails we went down. Um, And thank you, Josh, for being on the podcast for so long and discussing so many fantastic movies with me. Oh, it was my pleasure, you know, that you brought me on to start with uh, How to Train Your Dragon was uh, so special to me because I know how important that was to you. So I'm I'm honored to be a part of this journey with you, Kelly, and, and I will miss... Uh, the Fanimated podcast and I will miss recording these with you but I'm also excited for all of the wonderful things that will happen in your life uh, and the life of uh, all the others who who have been a part of this Um, and you know 
the listeners out there, you should know that Kelly has given her life to this project, and <laughs> I am so proud of her for all the things that she has grown and learned from and done. And uh, and so if you are able to, give her a round of applause wherever you are. <laughs> Aww. Josh, thank you. Stop it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's been a five-year-long project from the heart and I'm just so blessed to have so many great hosts like yourself and also so many fantastic amazing wonderful listeners like everyone listening right now and so thank you all for making the last five years absolutely amazing and listening to so much animation content (laughs) so much (laughs) (laughs) um so, yeah, like, we, you know, Fanimated is retiring, but that doesn't mean you have to stop listening. Um, all of the episodes will be on the Fanimated YouTube channel. You can search Fanimated Podcast um, on YouTube to find us there. And if, if there's ever a rant I really need to get out of my system, I will upload it there. <laughs> As always, just, you know, going through the the normal outro things, the music is written by the wonderful Jamie Krause. The art is done by myself, and you can continue to find me on Instagram at CandorDraw. Um, You'll see lots of other interesting creative content coming from me over there, so definitely check it out. Um, And... Yeah, this is this is wild. This is the third to last episode, so we've got two more, everybody. Again, the last episode will be September 26. So gear up because I will cry. <laughs> we all gonna cry, Kelly. We all gonna cry. Oh. <laughs> we are. We are. Oh my goodness, I'm already going to. But before I do, um, Josh, would you like to do your final outro with me? Yes, I would. Okay. Well, listeners, um, definitely, you know, keep a watch out for the last two episodes. Um, And as always, stay tuned. And stay animated. I have zero plan per usual, and we're just going (laughs) to... have a conversation about the the apocalypse (laughs) (laughs) okay